So for the past week, we've been talking about waves and how they travel through medium. And then we started to apply those facts to how sound works. So now we're going to kind of take a step back and review that information and then uh, start applying it to how light works because it's a little different from what we've been dealing with for the past week. So there are two different types of waves we haven't talked about yet. And if you've done the foldable or you're still working on it, you should see these two types of waves being um, brought up. The first type is electromagnetic. We've talked about this in terms of energy, and we said that another word for this was light. So these waves are made of a combination of electric fields and magnetic fields, as you can see in the bottom corner of this uh, slide. And the cool thing about these is that they do not require a medium to travel through. And if you think about it, um, the way that the light gets from the sun to the earth, it travels through space. And remember, space is the emptiness, um, a vacuum that does not have matter to travel through. So um, that's one way that sound is different from light because sound does need a medium to travel through. Travels at 300 million meters per second. And then there it is in scientific notation um, as it goes through space. So this is way faster than sound. Transverse waves means that the light is moving the medium that it does travel through at right angles to the direction in which the waves are moving. And so this picture underneath here shows that the energy is traveling like this, but the medium itself is being moved perpendicular to that direction. So light is kind of interesting in how it behaves because it has properties of waves that we've been talking about with um, matter moving into crest and trough shapes, but it also behaves like a stream of particles that kind of has random motion. So two properties of light support this theory and they're called polarizing light and photoelectric effect. So this first theory is called polarizing light, and this supports the idea that light moves in this organized wave that creates crests and troughs. Um, and one thing we can use to show this theory is called a polarizing filter. This is the same type of material that you can see in sunglasses where there is a tinted substance that doesn't allow the light to pass through very easily. Um, and so this filter that we'll work with in class is an object that acts like it has horizontal slits all through the substance, or it has these vertical slits. And in, it, they're microscopic. So the light passes easily through just one polarizing filter, but if I take two of them and place them on top of each other and tilt one so that one has the slits going in a horizontal direction and the other has them going vertically, the wave can't pass through them at all and you end up being just looking through this black material. If the light were just random particles that could move wherever they want, they would still be able to find a way to pass through, pass through these slits. So that supports this idea that it's polarized. And this diagram shows what I'm talking about here, and this, the top pictures show the polarized filters. So if I have two, pic, two filters that are placed right next to each other and they have their slits going in the same direction, it would be kind of similar as if I threaded a rope through two picket fences that had um, the slats going in the same direction. And if one person flicked their wrist, then the rope would easily pass through the slats with no problem. There would be nothing to stop its motion. However, if I take those two fences and I have one that has the slats going vertically and the other one with the slats going horizontally, then once the wave passes through the first fence with no problem, it is going to encounter a barrier in the second and it's not going to really have the energy pass through it anymore. So that's why you see this part of the rope um, completely unaffected by the energy of the wave. Again, you'll see this in class when we practice with the polarized filters themselves. The other type of um, theory that discusses how light behaves, it kind of seems like it contradicts the other. Um, it's kind of opposite, and this is something that Einstein came up with. And he realized that sometimes when you shine a light on an object, the electrons from that object start to move. And it's kind of like what we talked about um, with nuclear energy, where we compared it to um, shooting a neutron at a nucleus and all the particles of the nucleus kind of spread out. They move away from each other. Same idea from this. When a light is shown on objects, sometimes the electrons bounce off and they kind of bump off like a stream just in this picture. 
So this picture shows that different colors of lights that are shown on this slab of metal actually end up having uh, different speeds of the particles bouncing back off of that metal. So different colors, different energies of these, these light waves affect the metal differently. So let's review a little bit um, and take a step back with our vocabulary and just remind ourselves about how to label parts of a wave. So the top parts of the wave are called the crests. The bottom parts are like called troughs and they're very similar to like a feeding trough that some of you may have on a farm or you may have seen it somewhere. Um, and that's why we use that name to describe that same shape. Remember wavelength tells me the distance from crest to crest or trough to trough so it's one full wave and the frequency depends on the wavelength. Um, the distance of those waves or the measurement of the distance between waves tells me how many can possibly pass through a point every second and remember that unit is called hertz. The interesting thing here is remember with sound it determined what note we heard and with light this tells me what color of light I can see. Um, and so just think of the rainbow, you know, think of anything where you can see color. The color that you're seeing depends on the type of light waves that are hitting your eyes. And they all change based on the frequency. So the higher the frequency, um, you're going to be closer to like purple colors, purple and blue. Low frequency waves are reds and oranges and so uh, we'll again talk about that later on in the week as we discuss the visible spectrum all the different colors that we can see. Now in class we talked about amplitude and how it affects sound. Remember it's the distance from rest to crest or rest to trough so the height or the distance that the molecules move away from rest and remember amplitude determined the intensity of a sound so how loud the sound was or how soft the sound was and in terms of Light, again, if we talk about intensity of light, that means how bright the light is. So the higher the amplitude, the brighter the light would be. It would be hard to look into that light. The smaller the amplitude, the dimmer the light would be. Now back into speed, we just said what the speed of light is earlier in the notes, but just to remind our ourselves how this relates to waves, it tells me how far one wave travels in a unit of time. A lot of times we put it in terms of seconds. And something interesting just to know exactly how fast the, the speed of light is, is that it travels almost 900 times faster than sound. So that explains why during a thunderstorm you see lightning and then several seconds later, depending on how far that lightning was away from you, you hear the thunder. So they are not actually two separate things. The thunder is the sound of the lightning. It just takes longer to get to you. So we've talked about what interference means. It's when two waves combine, and there are two different types. One is constructive interference. Oh, well, if we have two waves combining and building on top of each other, we end up with brighter colors. And if we have destructive interference, they cancel each other out, and we end up with dimmer colors. So to preview what we're going to talk about in tomorrow's notes about how waves interact in terms of light, just remind you what reflection is. It's when a wave hits a surface that it can't pass through, and so it ends up bouncing back. And when we talk about light um, and objects that reflect light, I think the most obvious thing we would talk about tomorrow is, is mirrors. When light refracts, it bends because it changes the speed that it's traveling because of the material it's going through. So when white light bends, so just plain light that's coming out of a light bulb, if it gets bent, um, like maybe going through a prism or through a raindrop, it turns into the visible spectrum. So that's what causes rainbows in the sky. If this visible spectrum, these separated wavelengths in this bottom corner is bent again, it'll turn back into white light. And so we'll do some practice with this in class so you can see it happening. We'll also practice with lenses as well so you can see how the light changes what you see based on how it's bending. Finally, diffraction is the last type of interaction we talked about last week. And that's when waves bend around the edge of a barrier. And this is actually what allows cameras to work. Um, if you've noticed, on if you use your phone for your camera, or if you still have a camera yourself, um, many times there's just a tiny little hole that allows the light to go through it. And it really controls um, the amount of light or uh, the direction that the light is traveling into the camera. And we can talk more in detail about that in class. Um, so if you guys have any questions about 
the basics of light waves. Again, make sure you write them down and bring them to class for our discussion and for some labs. And over the next couple of days, again, we'll apply how light interacts uh, through refraction, refraction and reflection and uh, be ready to do some labs with that this week. I'll see you later.